All right. Hey everyone, good morning, good afternoon. Depending on where you're joining me from, my name is Barton Seaver. I'm a chef, author, husband, father, joining you from the ragged, jagged, delicious coast of Maine, where we live on a little saltwater farm. And uh, yeah, life is good. It's the summertime. Life in Maine is good. I hope that all in your world are thriving. I hope that you are happy and healthy. I hope that you are enjoying some time off in this summer and that, uh, well, yeah, and that your life is delicious. Thanks for joining us here today for this open office hours. Bring whatever questions you've got for me. Put them over there in that uh, in the box right there next to my my face there on the screen. What you're going to do there is um, well, type in whatever question you have for whatever it is. Uh, it doesn't even have to be related to any culinary topic necessarily. So throw your question in over there. If there's a question that's already been asked that's particularly relevant to you that you'd like to make sure that I get to today, just click that little heart icon in, that, in the question to vote it up to the top to make sure that I get to it. I've got a hard out today uh, just after 3 o'clock my time uh, because I have a contractor coming over to finish up one of the very last parts of my outdoor kitchen that I have been building. Yes, I have an outdoor kitchen now at the back of my property, back, back beyond the farm that... Um, I am very much looking forward to having. I had a five foot wide wood grill and an induction burner out there and just a couple more things to do. And well, hey, life is good. If I could spend the rest of my life working just to keep what I've got, I would be so very happy. And that's one of the things I wanna to talk to you about is gratitude. Any of you who've joined me before in any of these things know that I like to talk about something uh, about gratitude because well, feeding people is an act of love. It is an act of kindness. It is an act of uh, virtue and well, the first and best ingredient in cooking for other people is gratitude. Gratitude for those we are able to feed, gratitude for the food that we are able to use and for our health and happiness. So uh, to me, I like to start these little events off that we do every other week with a little moment of gratitude. And uh, yeah, I am grateful that uh, I, have, I have the beginnings of an outdoor kitchen, a way to spend time outdoors with my family, several, several months of the year, cooking dinner right off the farm. And um, life is good. Life is very good. I hope that you will take a minute to reflect on something that you have in your life that is particularly that particularly brings you happiness and joy. And uh, whenever you feed other people, that you take a minute also to thank yourself for what you are doing, because this world needs more love, and feeding people is just that—an act of love. All right, there we go. All the hokey stuff aside, right? Let's dive into some questions here. We got some good ones. Thank you for all of you who have put them in already. So from Phoenix. Uh, what are some examples of sp or specific examples of food related jobs for those who do not aspire to be a chef, nutritionist or work in a kitchen? And uh, how do we access those networks if you're a member of a marginalized community? Great questions, both. All right. Um, so specifics in terms of, of, of jobs. I mean, the, the, the food world is as big as it gets. It is as complex as it gets. So the number of different iterations of jobs in the food world are incredible. You, you could end up um, running a line production at Campbell's food company, you know, making tomato soup. Somebody's got to make that, right? Uh, you could be working in, you know, one of those box delivery meal kit companies where the kitchens are really sort of setting people up for success in their own home kitchens. Like that sounds fun, right? Uh, you could be a food stylist, a food photographer. You could be a, a brewer, make beer, make wine, etc. cetera, uh, a journalist. I mean, literally anything you can think of to think about or do with food is, is a job there. Um, but, uh, you know, specifically some of the things that I really ha have seen that people have enjoyed or, or jobs that I've, I've worked with people in those positions that I, I thought would be nice. Like food stylist, a prop stylist at a magazine, a test cook at a magazine or a website. So you're still in the kitchen cooking every day, but you're just not with that, well, you have better hours probably too, but not with that rush and the heady, uh, <laughs> the needs, all the needs of the, of the restaurant world, et cetera. Um, how do you access these networks though, uh, as a member of a marginalized community? I would say one of the greatest resources that I've seen is the James Beard Foundation. They do a lot of work and have tentacles into many, many aspects of the food world. Um, and they also do a lot of work around really bringing diversity into the kitchen, bringing diversity into the food space, whether that's in food media, whether it's in restaurant kitchens uh, itself. So those networks are very, very powerful. People are very, very um, 
interested in lifting up others. Uh, and they're very, they're very vocal. They're very active. Uh, other ones would be the IACP, the International Association of Culinary Professionals. Uh, this is a, a great organization that um, really focuses on people outside necessarily of the restaurant industry. A lot of it is food media, food stylists, food photographers, videographers, etc. So it is a place, uh, sort of a digital forum uh, with meetings as well, that offers opportunity for people in those non-restaurant spaces to, to convene. So IACP, the James Beard Foundation, uh, or two. And then uh, Women Chefs and Restaurateurs is another great organization that is a little bit more focused on uh, restaurants and, and restaurant chefs, but those networks are deep. Uh, and the, the, all three of those organizations are specifically built in order to help people within the community gain access to networks uh, and to bring all that you can to this wonderful industry. So thank you, Phoenix, for wanting to bring yourself and your talents to all of us, to, to this industry, to feed other people. It's really awesome. And we need all of the voices we can have. So thank you for joining yours to the cause. Appreciate you. Thanks for joining us today here too. All right, uh, next question coming from Lynn B. Hey, I'm interested in fermentation, mostly sourdough bread starters. Do you have suggestions to put together a great starter? You know, Lynn, uh, this is outside of my expertise. I am, I am simply not a baker. Um, I, uh, you know what, we'll forward you that question on to some of our baker colleagues at Ruby, some of our chef colleagues, instructors there, and they probably would be able to give you a lot better re list of resources than I do. So we'll forward that question on and expect to hear from us via your email. All right. Hey, thanks, Lynn. Appreciate you. All right. From... Brian, unfortunately, while I'm working, I'm working while office hours takes place. Can I find the recordings for all of these open office sessions? Yes, you can. Immediately following this, probably about 20 minutes or so later, uh, once we sign off here today, you will get a link in your email, uh, the same email three as you registered for this, uh, leading you back to the archive of this event, as well as for every other Ruby Live event that we've ever done. I think there's, uh, well several thousand, uh, over a thousand maybe at this point. Um, anyway, there's a lot of resources back there and we will point you back to them. So cheers, Brent. Thanks. All right. From Beth R. Watched your TED talk and love my message. Well, thank you. I appreciate you checking that out and finding that. So for any of you out there who are interested, I, I gave a TED talk on sustainable seafood, which is my focus in career and culinary as well. But uh, thank you for that, Beth. I have a question, though, she says, about browning mushrooms. You get the pan heated to the proper temp, and then, uh, and then, oh, question's bouncing around on here. Mushrooms aren't going to brown in just a matter of a minute, but they need to release their water and evaporate it in order to brown. So there's a couple of, um, a couple of ways to go about this. First and foremost, yes, you can brown uh, mushrooms very, very quickly in a dry pan or in a pan with oil or butter added to it. Uh, the things that you would want to do to get them brown very quickly uh, are to make sure your pan is superheated, make sure your oil or your butter, whatever you add to the pan as your medium, is also very hot. Get that to the point that you want to be at. If you're using butter, even let the butter brown just a little bit, adding that browned flavor to the dish uh, before you put it in. But before we dive into, in, into the other ways to do this, let's think about what are you, what are you trying to accomplish uh, with your mushrooms? So there, there's many ways of thinking about this, right? Is, is the mushroom, are they going to be then folded into a sauce afterwards, like a demi gloss for a steak or something like that, right? Okay, well, that's a different amount of brown as well as a different amount of moisture that you're going to want in your final product. Are you sauteing them and then adding some garlic and herbs, a little bit of white wine to kind of make a pan sauce out of them and serving them as a side dish? Uh, are you browning a portobello mushroom to serve as sort of a center of the plate, more aesthetic, et cetera? Or are you making like a duxelle where you're taking finely chopped mushrooms and you really want to cook them all the way down so that there is no moisture left. So it's this dry, wonderfully perfumed, mushroomy flavored, intense paste that then gets used for other things such as stuffing a chicken breast or uh, folding into goat cheese, Etc. You name it. So the key here is how much water do you want in your final mushrooms? 
So when I'm making like a mushroom side dish, like mushrooms, I sear them in butter and garlic, olive oil, and I throw them into a smoking hot pan. And I'm not afraid to get the oil smoking hot. I get them nice and brown. And basically after that first minute, as soon as they begin to release their moisture, then I'll add the garlic to the pan. So it doesn't overcook with the mushroom. I'll add garlic to the pan and then I will add my salt, toss the pan to you know, get the, the brown bits of the, of the mushrooms off the bottom, the contact there. And then what, you've, what you're left with is mushrooms that are just beginning to release their liquid into this wonderful oil. Excuse me, let me turn my phone off. That's poor etiquette there. Um, just beginning to release their liquid into the oil. Are they as brown as they could possibly be? No, but are they browned and flavored and caramelized and the, the flavor is developed the way I want them to be? Yes. So I want all that mushroom juice, that liquor that comes out of them to kind of make that pan sauce to then emulsify with the oil and the butter that I was sauteing in as I'm tossing the herbs in. Cool. Like I cook this whole dish. The thing takes two, three minutes max. I use a big pan. So there's lots of room for the mushrooms. The last thing you want to do is if you're trying to brown is to overcrowd them because if a mushroom is sitting on top of a mushroom, it's never going to brown, right? It's just going to steam, release liquid, liquid, and prevent other things from browning. So it's really all about how much moisture you want in your final product. The one thing I will say though, is if you're trying to brown mushrooms, um, immediately adding that salt, uh, at the end is very important because salt will draw that moisture out of the mushroom that, as it does with everything. If you're trying to dehydrate those mushrooms, sort of simmer them out and then brown them, adding salt at the very beginning is the way to go so that you're applying less heat, but getting more of the effect that you're looking for. So a little bit of a long answer there, but mushrooms are a complicated and interesting uh, ingredient category. Um, and they also sort of fit into so many different dishes or styles of use that it's important always um, in cooking, I think, especially uh, to think about what is the purpose of my action here? What is the outcome that I desire? And then designing your methodology to get you there. Thanks, Beth. Appreciate you. Great question. Cool. All right, from Larry. Hey, Barton, wondering if you have a brand of stainless mixing bowls I could recommend. Light, well-made, and stacking set of three or so. So many choices, yeah. Uh, Larry, actually, I huh, just bought a new set of bowls the other day because we were doing uh, filming some new content for, for Ruby for the pro course, and uh, they are the Wick, Whisk, Wisco brand, W Y H. I'm sorry, W-H-Y-S-K-O, Wisco. And they were nesting, stacking bowls, and they are very light. They seem well-made, and I've owned them for just several weeks now. So, you know, I haven't put them through the ringer yet. But honestly, what am I going to do to a bowl that's going to break it? They seem well-made. They were, they were cheap. They look good. They nest well. There you go. That's my recommendation. There are probably a thousand others out there that I would – equally accept. So I'm not sure you can really go wrong with this. Um, so yeah, there you go, Larry. Cheers. Thanks. From Luis. Hi, friend. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining. Hope all is well. All is well, man. Um, could you recommend to me the best equipment to get started on stir frying outside if I'm a beginner? Uh -huh. Oh, uh, outside. I'm wondering what, what are you cooking over outside? Um, I'm assuming maybe a gas burner, but the outside and stir fry is not really typically, um, I, it's not really kind of the cooking that I think to do outside. But I'll tell you what I use. And let me, uh, where is it? So this is what I got. And uh, this was a Christmas present. So this is the lodge. Uh, cast iron wok. And what I like about this is that it is, um, uh, it's very dense and like cast iron, it holds heat really, really well. So I've got gas burners inside and I've got an induction burner outside and wood fire outside. So uh, it's hard sometimes to get enough flame, a big enough flame that's hot enough 
that's big enough to really heat this thing that, you know, if you go into an Asian restaurant where they're using woks, they have specific burners that are designed for them that are jet burners. I mean, they are as big as the wok so that you are getting heat equally up the sides of it as well. And that's the whole point is that you have such a huge amount of surface area in the wok that's all hot so that you can cook so very quickly. Um, so this is the one that I really like is the lodge one. That's just my preference. I don't do a whole lot of stir frying. So I, I'm not a whole, I'm not like a, a big expert on it in terms of what are all the little intricacies and nuances that you might look at. But you know what, when I was buying this, I also, I was checking out cooks illustrated had a list of their recommendations for walks. Uh, and if you search that out, Cooks Illustrated walk recommendations, uh, they went through and sort of scored like Consumer Reports does a whole bunch of different walks and gave some really good examples as to what they do best, what they do poorly, etc. cetera. Um, so that's probably the best resource I can point you to because that will help you navigate, you know, whatever unique little culinary ecosystem you have. Um, we'll make the best choice, but cool. Join us again. Let us know how the walk, the, how the walk frying is going, man. I'd love to hear. Cheers. Thanks to you. Appreciate you. All right. Hey, Nancy. Nice to have you join us. Thank you so much. You just joined the pro cook program and you're super excited about it. And we are so super excited to have you. Welcome to the Ruby family, but you're really nervous. You're a little bit nervous because you have celiac and you are helping to modify any tax tasks without uh, using gluten-free Ingredients, will this impact your grades in any way on assignment, especially around breads, things where, well, gluten is, is far more sort of inclusive typically. Uh, Nancy, absolutely not. Are they going to affect your grades? Uh, you, you absolutely under no circumstance will be punished uh, for having celiac. So I, you know, we're with you on this. And thanks for joining us and trusting us with your education. And we really hope to deliver the very best product that we can to you. And in that means, uh, the, the best thing to do is to reach out to us before any given task to say, you know, I see that in this task coming up, uh, there's celiac uh, you know, concerns about some of the ingredients. What can I do? In that way, we're going to get right back to you and we're going to have a whole list of options for you. And we'll be able to guide you through that task and that learning in ways that you're going to get that full learning scope of learning around that um, that process or that method that we're trying to teach. Um, but certainly we will, we will design this, help design this in a way so that you are safe and healthy and happy and pleased with the results, right? We're here for you. So the, the key is just reach out beforehand uh, if there's any task where you have a particular concern rather than sort of try and come up with something on your own and then present it, uh, you know, or send it in to us and then have it not be quite right for the pedagogy of the, that learning outcome, et cetera. That's all we're we would try and do is just guide you to the right ingredients so that the, whatever it is, you're learning what we, what we need you to know. Hey, thank you again for joining us. Great question. Appreciate you. Thanks for taking care of yourself, by the way. Self-care is self-love and self-love is, uh, is, is really important. So appreciate you, Nancy. All right. From, uh, Davian. Hi, friend. Nice to have you join. We heard you speaking about induction cooking, but you're struggling to gain control of this method. Any good resources for an induction to stovetop introduction cooking? Honestly, can't control anything for fear or not understanding the technology well enough. So uh, I actually myself have not used a whole lot of induction. Uh, the induction that I have, uh, I've really enjoyed. And when you heard me talking about it, I was talking about sort of where I would go with my kitchen. If I were to redesign it, I would get rid of gas. I, I would love to be completely fossil fuel free in my life. Um, and we're, we're almost there with really the exception of this stove, uh, solar energy on the house, et cetera. And, um, but so I don't have a huge deep experience with induction. It is what I would recommend though, uh, having cooked on it before and really liked it. Um, some of the newer versions that are coming out, some of the stovetops that I've seen, and I've got an induction, a two burner, just portable induction stovetop that I'm using outside in my kitchen. Uh, and I really like this because the one that it, I have, and I don't remember a brand on it, um, has a visual cue on it as to the heat of the pan. So you can look down and see out of 10 bars, 
that it's sitting at seven bars, et cetera. Um, that to me is the same intuition as looking at a gas flame and knowing where it is, right? I'm not really looking at the knobs on the gas flame. I'm looking at the flame itself. In the same way, sort of looking at those bars is more helpful sometimes. Um, and I think it's some, the bars are sort of looking at a visual representation as opposed to a numerical representation. Like it's on heat two. It's like, okay, well, is that two of five? Is that two of 10? Uh, what's the difference between two and three, et cetera. It just begs a lot of questions, right? But if you're looking at it and you're like, okay, I'm at 70% power here. Cool. I, I get it. Even though I just gave you a numerical representation of, of the visual, just looking at it, I think gives you that visual feel to it that helps your own intuitions sort of bring, be, bring those intuitions to the table with the new technology. Um, pans will also respond slightly differently just as they do on you know, on a gas cooktop as well. So whether it's um, you know, stainless steel or cast iron, et cetera, uh, or cast steel, just it does take a little bit of trial and error, like with anything. Um, honestly, I'm, I'm kind of with you. Like if you ask me to cook on an electric stove now, like an electric coil stove, I really wouldn't be able to do it very well. I, I mean, it would take me some time. It, it's just about trial and error and, um, yeah, there you go. One thing to do is see if uh, there's a restaurant in your area that cooks on induction and ask if you can just come and stage with them for a day uh, just to learn about the technology. They get some free labor out of you. You get a great learning experience, meet some new friends. Um, you know, that's something I recommend to people anyway, always is just find some professionals in the field that you like and trust. Go, go give them, give them some labor to learn from them for a day and create great, create great relationships. Cheers. Thanks, Devin. Appreciate you. From Omar. Hey, friend. Nice seeing you again. Thanks for coming back. You're going to be in New Hampshire in Maine next week. Awesome, dude. Awesome. 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 Can I recommend any spots for different seafood experiences? Doesn't have to be fancy. Sure. Okay. Um, so I'm assuming you're going to stay in Southern Maine. So I'm going to go from like Wiscasset down to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So Portsmouth, New Hampshire, row 34. There's a restaurant by my dear, dear friend, Jeremy Sewell. Uh, it is absolutely fantastic. He's got another outpost of that down in Boston as well, uh, as well as Burlington, Mass. But Row 34 in downtown Portsmouth is is just wonderful. Uh, they, they do everything perfectly. The best oyster program anywhere on the East Coast, I think. Uh, you can't go wrong. Uh, getting up into Maine, let's see. Uh, I don't really know a whole lot south of us uh, other than the Clam Shack in Kennebunk which is the very best clam shack in the country run by my dear friend, Steve Kingston. Uh, I just saw him late last week and uh, it's nice to reconnect with them, but what do they do? They do lobster rolls and they do fried clams and that's it. My French fries and coleslaw, I think too, but uh, like it is, it is perfect. It, it, there's very rare in food when I say something is perfect. Uh, Steve Kington's the clam shack in Kennebunkport, Maine is perfect. In Portland, I really love a place called Gilbert's Chowder House. Uh, it is kind of a greasy spoon seafood diner kind of concept where, you know, you look in the back and it's just like the same cook that's been working there for 35 years is still there. And it's just like slinging fried seafood, really, really great fried, be big, beautiful, meaty scallops, big plates of, of thick cut French fries. Their coleslaw is really good. They do a great job with local mussels that they're bringing in, just steamed white wine, marinara. Um, they got outdoor seating. Yeah, you can get a lobster dinner. You can get all that stuff too. But it's it's really kind of where locals go to eat. It's where I send people most of the time for just an easy, you know, get a great cold, <laughs> get a great cold beer for me and a nice plate of good fried seafood. They do some other stuff as well. But um, Gilbert's upscale, I would say Scales Restaurant, which is actually just uh, a few doors down from uh, Gilbert's Chatterhouse. So Scales is probably the the quintessential high-end seafood restaurant. Eventide Oyster Bar is sort of the quintessential modern oyster bar. They do a really great job. They've got some really interesting topic toppings for uh, their oyster program, whether it's a Tabasco granita or other different shaved ices, flavored ices as toppings for their oysters. 
Uh, they do some really interesting uh, lobster rolls as well, including one like a brown butter lobster roll that's served on a steamed bun. Um, hard to get into. They won a James Beard Award. And ever since then, the, uh, the duck boat tours stop in front and drop off people. There's usually a couple hour waiting list, but um, it's worth it to get on the waiting list and go walk around Portland and then come back to it. So, And then heading north in Wiscasset, there's a place called um, Red's Eats which has a long line, but it is the quintessential place to get a lobster roll. They don't measure the amount of lobster they put into it. They just pile it on until not a single piece of lobster more could fit on top of this lobster roll. It's expensive. It's also two meals. I mean, seriously, my wife and I can barely finish one lobster roll together and everything else they do is good, friendly people. And you get to stand in the sunshine of Maine on literally on the water and wait for your lobster roll. So couple great locations where you also check out Harbor Fish, uh, which is a seafood market here in Portland, in Portland, Maine. Uh, they've got oysters that you can take and chuck there. They've got smoked seafoods that you can take just for a little snack and, you know, et cetera, some prepared stuff. Uh, but it's also just the best fish market that I as a civilian have ever had access to. Uh, and it's just fun to go in there. And it's, it's got soul. It's got spirit. It's got the best fish. Fun place. Check it out. All right, Omar. Thanks, buddy. I see Alex. See, I got another question from you too here. Uh, picked up two if by C for me. Oh, thanks, buddy. I appreciate that. So two if by C is one of my uh, seafood cookbooks, and your uh, in hopes of incorporating more seafood into your diet. Awesome. What would you recommend as a general substitute for white wine that's used in many of your recipes, especially the broths? Uh, lemon juice and broth diluted with white balsamic, etc. Um, yeah, actually, both of those uh, would be good. So even just water does well. I mean, water and lemon juice would be fine uh, in terms of adding volume and the acidity. Really what white wine is there to do is to add acidity, but also a liquid vehicle for flavors to meld together, right? To bring things together. And that, if that's in a broth, et cetera, clam juice is another one. You can get that just the bottled clam juice, which is actually really very good. Uh, a product that I, I, wholly recommend. You can dilute that a little bit. You are introducing clam flavor, uh, certainly. So just make sure you want that in your dish. Uh, but a little bit goes a long way in, in that way. Um, but water with uh, a little bit of balsamic, a white balsamic, or just red vinegar, white wine vinegar, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, all of that would work. So uh, there's also verjou. V-E-R-J-U-S. Verju is the unfermented must or juice of wine grapes. So there's no alcohol in it. It was never fermented into wine, but it has those winey flavors, well, at least the grape, grapey, wine grape flavors to it. So Sauvignon Blanc Verju is going to have bright, nice acidity. It's going to have all those sort of lime, calcareous, beautiful aromas that you'd look for in a Sauvignon Blanc wine. It also has the acidity of those grapes in there as well. It has some sugar in it too, because that sugar isn't been converted into alcohol. So it's still there and sort of sits on the palate. So just be aware of that, that it uh, does add more sweetness than wine does, but it really does function in the same purpose and way that wine does. Verju, V-E-R-J-U-S. Omar, appreciate you. Hey, safe travels and really, really enjoy this New England coast. It's a great time to be here. All right, from Fawn, hi there. I don't have white dishes for plating. What do I need? Uh, you need whatever you've got, fun. That's it. So in our grading, uh, we don't, you know, we don't specify white plates. I, I think most of the videos show on white plates, but really uh, the plating aspects of it, whether it's grading whatever dish you are presenting or in the plating specific sections, uh, we don't judge around the, the plates used. It's really just the techniques used, the spacing between things, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there's no need for you to go out and get something new just for the purposes of grading uh, for this. But, um, you know, I have, this is what I've dedicated my entire life and career to, and I live and work out of this house. So I have a lot of props having done eight cookbooks, et cetera. So, I've got big platters. I do a lot of entertaining. I've got big green platters. I've got blue platters. I've got white platters. I've got plates. Um, I, I am able to do that. I am blessed and fortunate. Uh, but um, 
yeah, in terms of what you need, go with what you got. Thanks, Vaughn. Appreciate you. All right. Uh, let's see. What was the seafood dish that made me want to specialize in seafood from our new friend Arden? Hi, friend. Thanks for joining us. Um, you know, when I was a kid, let's see. I'll, I'll be right back. Actually, I have the picture. It's right over here. No, maybe I lost it. Oh, there it is. There you go. That's me. 1981. A year and a half old, two years old. Uh, just over two years old with uh, a whole bushel of blue crabs. Yep. That's, uh, that's what got me into it. So I was born and raised in Washington, D.C. And um, here's another picture of me as a kid. Kids are awesome. Anyway, um, born and raised in Washington, D.C., and we had access to the, the great seafood of the Chesapeake Bay down there. And I just remember as a kid, like that, some of my greatest memories were of uh, any time that we got to get out of the city, which was pretty rare, but times we got to go down to the Chesapeake or go down to the Main Avenue Seafood Market, which was on Main Avenue in Washington, D.C., the oldest continuing, continuously operating seafood market in America. And they would just have these barges there that floated on the Potomac River and they would just be stacked with seafood. And it was just such a cultural experience to go down there. That's where this picture was taken. And uh, probably at Captain White's down there, if any of you DC folks know that. But um, yeah, it was blue crabs and just sitting around a big mess of crabs and learning how to pick them and understanding that some meals just take four hours. Uh, was really what caused me to fall in love with seafood. But um, uh Aside from that, really, it's not so much one dish as it is just the diversity of taste, textures, colors, seasonalities, flavors, stories, narratives, histories that's represented by seafood. You know, chicken? Okay, white or dark. Salmon? Well, do you want king salmon, keto salmon, pink salmon, coho salmon, sockeye salmon, Atlantic salmon, Arctic char, steelhead trout? Like, okay, whoa, I mean, that's just salmon, right? that's cool. You want salmon collars? You want salmon tail? I mean, salmon skin. There's just so much there. And that's just salmon. Think about the literally thousands of other species that are out there that each bring with them all of their own uniquenesses and, you know, just the, the joy of working with them. And it's that diversity that I really so admire and appreciate about seafood that caused me to dedicate my career to it. Arden, thank you. I hope I appreciate the question. And I hope that you find the dish or the ingredient category or just the cuisine that you want to dedicate yourself to. And uh, I hope you just, you see it through. So thanks for joining us. Appreciate you being part of the family. All right, Martin from Beth. Just finished my pro cook certification. Was anxious to take a seafood literacy class. What happened to it? You don't see it being offered. Huh. I think if you just go to seafoodliteracy.com, uh, you will find it, I sure hope. Um, I'm, I'll bet you that Richard, my colleague at Ruby, who is manning the back end of this uh, event, is probably looking at this right now. So we'll put up a link for it and just make sure that it, it's available. And thank you for your interest in that. I sure appreciate it. And I can't wait to see you in class. So we'll get you, we'll, we'll get you over a link to that. Thanks, Beth. All right, from Victoria. Hi, friend. Nice to have you join us. I hope you're doing well. I am doing well. I'm right back at you. I hope you're thriving. Life is good, huh? All right. Do I have any suggestions for a pot or pan set? Everyone claims to have the best brand and it gets very overwhelming when trying to figure out what is good quality. Thanks, Victoria. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah, that gets confusing. And there's a lot, there's a lot to that, Victoria. Also, I mean, from aesthetics to use to what kind of cuisine you're doing, um, you know, how many people you're cooking for, you know, if you're cooking at home, et cetera. Uh, let me tell you, I have, again, just sort of back to the plates. Like I have so many pots and pans in my, in my life because I've, I've written and styled and prop styled eight cookbooks and I have way too much. And I, I know that. Um, but let me point out the things that I use. Um, in terms of a set, I think... The things that I would do, not do without. Um, 
There you go. All right. So I recognize that this is four different brands of product here. So it, that, that really won't help you uh, in terms of the set. But these types of pans, the sauce pans, uh, that is the type of thing you are going to buy in a set and get, um, you know, you probably get a small fry pan as well in there. So with this, really what fits your aesthetic, I mean, what do you want to look at and take care of and think about when you're washing your dishes every night and, you know, what's your budget also? So I saved up my Christmas presents for three years. I didn't get any Christmas presents so that I could buy myself this set of copper pans. Um, Cause I just really, really love them. I love the patina of them. I love the way they look. I love the weight of them. I love the history of them, the, the craft of them. And I spent uh, a, basically a mortgage payment on these pans. And I got a whole set of them and they sit up there in my kitchen and they're just absolutely beautiful. I am very fortunate and lucky in life to be able to afford such a thing. But what you need is two saucepans of different sizes, vegetables, cooking rice, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one 10 inch saute pan is really what I recommend. This is the one that I use the most. Again, this is a nice, this is a copper one. This is the Moviel brand. Um, this, I think like the three piece set, or maybe even a four or five piece set, because you probably get lids on these. Um, a brand that I would recommend that is uh, out in the world, it's not sold necessarily retail, but you can find it uh, online is Vita Craft, V I T A Craft, Vita Craft. Um, they're made in the US. They're five ply induction stainless steel, so you can use them on any kind of stove. Uh, and I find that this is, pr is probably just the best of the commercial slash sort of home cook cookware that I've ever used. I mean, it heats beautifully. It responds beautifully. It cleans easily. Uh, the grommets and stuff that are on the side that keep the handles on are actually attached. So the handles stay attached. There are some brands out there that are sold by national kitchen retailers that uh, I find that that doesn't always happen with. I won't name names. Uh, but the Vitacraft, so looking at saute pan, two size pots, et cetera, from Vitacraft, and I know they make all of those sizes. I have some of them out in the prop closet they use for catering and stuff. Um, that's what I would recommend. I also recommend having some heavy cookware, uh, whether this is a Lodge cast iron, which is $40, or this, which was one of my wedding gifts, uh, which is $200. So this is a Le Creuset pot. I've also been using this for 13 years and it's the most used pot in my kitchen mostly. Um, and I'm going to hand it down to my kids one day. So, you know, when you talk about price, there's also the fact that I'm never going to replace any of these. So I, I do save money on, on that quality there, but uh, one big cast iron or Le Creuset sort of cookware like that, uh, 10 inch saute pan, a smaller saute pan in addition, if you'd like, definitely these two. And then one large pot for stews, sauces, um, stocks, et cetera. It just makes it convenient. And then, uh, yeah, that's enough information. I've given me a lot there, but uh, I mean, I can go on and I'm just gonna start getting esoteric about different pots in my kitchen. So let me just put these away. So thanks for your question, I appreciate that. But also what I appreciate is the fact, Victoria, that you are in the fun position of stocking a kitchen if you're asking questions about this. So I hope that this is the result of some just like awesome life thing and you got like a new apartment or a house or something, or just like a new chapter in your life and you're ready to do something or upgrade or whatever, or just like step out on your own for the first time. Whatever you're doing, I think it's awesome. Thanks for making cooking a part of it. That's really cool. Appreciate you, Victoria. Cheers. All right, from Wamba. What are the ranks in culinary art? Do you think one can work independently as a chef in a private home after taking these programs from Ruby? Uh, certainly, yes, you can. Uh, I mean, you can, uh, certainly, uh, this these courses will give you the background and training to uh, be proficient enough to work in a private home as a private chef. Um, 
there's a lot of experience that you can gain from restaurants and for private chefs. Uh, I often actually recommend that you create some relationships with restaurants uh, that you go work in once a month or something, et cetera, just to keep your skills going. Because once you get isolated into your own home kitchen and you don't have the inputs of new dishes or new creativity or new cuisines, just different ideas from other line cooks, et cetera. Uh, it's not that you go backwards, but you know, the pace of learning can, can slow down unless you're really, really challenging and pushing yourself. So certainly after the pro cook course, you can certainly become a great private chef at home. What are the ranks in culinary arts? Uh, I mean, there's not really a rank so much as there are earned positions, um, which I guess could be called a rank. But I mean, uh, aside from the American Culinary Federation, which has a apprenticeship program where you know certified line cook means you've done these things and have these skill sets. A certified sous chef means you have these skill sets. Uh, the certified executive chef means you have these skill sets and it, it requires you to work up, up the line. Um, our program is ACF certification, so it does help you if you ever wanted to join the American Culinary Federation, which is a great, great network of chefs, peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning, great amount of resources. I was just at their national convention last week out in Las Vegas, and it was awesome to see so many friends and just what an incredible group of people that are all there to help each other. Uh, so recommend that group. Um, so there you go. Hey, I appreciate you. Thanks. Thanks for joining us today. From Katrina, excited for the program. Do you think a Vitamix is worth it or do you recommend another brand of blender? Also, do I have a favorite brand of food processor? I'm trying to figure out how much I should spend on both of these. Thanks. Um, good questions. Do I think a Vitamix is worth it? Uh, in a restaurant? Absolutely. Um, I was given a Vitamix in 2004 when I was named a rising star chef by starchefs.com. And that program is sponsored by Vitamix and, and sort of our trophy was that I got a Vitamix that I am still using, that I opened seven restaurants with that Vitamix. It traveled around with me. That thing is a beast. Oh my Lord, is it a good machine? Like it's, it just, it just works. It does exactly what you want it to do. Uh, so I do very wholly recommend the Vitamix brand. Do you need that as a home cook? Uh, certainly it will, it, it'll be great in your home kitchen. It's what I use. Uh, but I also have a small little Ninja, uh, which is hundreds of dollars cheaper. Uh, it has three different size canisters, you know, one that I use for grinding up garlic and shallots or something to make a, a paste. Um, and then two slightly larger ones and one into a canister. It's not nearly as high powered. I mean, a, let's, let's be honest, a Vitamix and an Evinrude outboard motor are about the same thing. <laughs> like you could put a Vitamix off the back of a boat and actually get somewhere, okay? Uh, the Ninja isn't nearly as powerful, but honestly, it's I kind of reach for it just as much because it has the smaller size containers, um, as does Vitamix now. They do have a smaller um, chamber uh, that, that, that I think is great, especially for making smoothies and stuff. Um, but uh, do you need both? Certainly not. But a Ninja also does kind of do the work of a food processor too. Um, and in that way, I think it might be the more versatile of the of those. Uh, my pro uh, food processor is my food processor was made in 1963, I believe. Yeah, this is. This is a 50 year old piece of equipment uh, that I'm still using because my grandmother gave this to me. It is dirty. It is old. I have replaced the uh, canister once. I've replaced the blades once, but um, it's my grandmother's food processor. How cool is that? I'm still using it. Look, it's got the sing, you know, just two prong plug. Like, 
this thing is great. So a Roboku, KitchenAid, whatever, uh, I think they're, they're great. This is probably the least used of the equipment that I have uh, from the Vitamix to the, the Ninja um, to, to the, the Roboku. So uh, I would probably maybe just, I don't know. You know what you're gonna you're gonna cook. You know what you're you, you're going to use them for. Uh, I really only use this if I'm making emulsions like uh, seafood mousseline, sausages, etc., things like that. Uh, really, I don't use it all that often. Like the the grinding attachments or the shredder attachment that it has. Like uh, you know what? I'm not shredding that much anything, but I can't just do it on a box grater. Um, so. I think I might be trying to talk you out of the, the, the food processor, but uh, I'm not. Like, I'm very happy that I have this. I just don't reach for it very often. Part of that is just also might just be what I cook, which is seafood and fresh vegetables. So I don't really have a whole lot of use for this, just in the cuisine that I prefer to eat. So if the things that you are making and like the dishes that you can see yourself doing in a kitchen and you see yourself needing this more than I do, take that into account so cool great question though and and uh again just as with victoria like awesome good for you for being in, in a phase where you're looking to you know upgrade and, and bring all that firepower into into your kitchen it's awesome stuff so i hope you enjoy cheers all right have i tried any seafood restaurants from tidewater virginia that i liked arden hey there again uh, tidewater virginia you know, it's been a long time since I've been down that way uh, that I, I can't I can't recommend anything down there for just not knowing what's down there. Uh, I'm sorry to say. And. Uh, yeah, just make sure that whatever the restaurant is that you're going to, the crabs, crabs coming from the Chesapeake and their oysters are, too. And then I think you're probably a good bet. Make sure they got a good flounder sandwich on the menu, too. Cheers, Arden. Thanks. Great question. All right. Thanks for answering a question. This is from Marcos. Hello, friend. Do you know any website that I can learn how to decorate salads from? Huh. Interesting. I no, not off the top of my head, other than just sort of a cursory Google search on that. Um, maybe look up vegetable pairing, P-A-R-I-N-G, pairing, as in like pairing knife, uh, or vegetable fluting, fluting, like, like the instrument flute. Um, you probably find some good in instructions about how to design, you know, cut watermelons or something like that into designs, fluting mushrooms into beautiful shapes, turning vegetables, uh, you know, so that they're fun and integrated into the salads well. So, but nothing off the top of my head. Sorry to say, that's not uh, something that I ever really did a lot of. I'm sort of a pretty natural, straightforward California Italian cuisine kind of cook where it's just like things are good enough as they are is my approach to things so I never really did a whole lot of decoration um, but you know one guy that does some really interesting salad decorations just just plating wise just interesting plates look up an uh, old cook Jean-Louis Paladin um, P-A-L-L-I-D-I-N Jean-Louis Paladin he ran a restaurant at the Watergate Hotel in D.C. His cookbook is exorbitantly expensive. It's out of print. I mean, I'm, I'm talking like it's $800 or something. So <clears throat> you, I, I'm not recommending that necessarily. But his platings were so ahead of his time. I mean, that book was published in the early 90s, I think, and it's still relevant. Um, but you look up the like, images of Jean-Louis Paladin plates uh, online. Another guy to look up, another chef, is Michel Bra. B-R-A-S, Michel Bra. Uh, he has a restaurant, three-star Michelin restaurant up in France. And he does some really, really intricate, amazing, amazing platings of dishes. Uh, and if you just look up his name and, you know, Google image, et cetera, you'll, you'll come up with a lot of really interesting plates. Um, and another one from sort of ages past uh, would be Charlie Trotter. Uh, his cookbooks are really fun. Those are pretty widely available and images of his food is out there, but he, he did a lot of really interesting plated sort of decorative salads, uh, as well as a chef named Alfred Portale, P-O-R-T-A-L-E, Alfred Portale, who is at the, uh, where is he at the water grill? Um, he may still, it may be there now uh, in New York, but um, 
just he did a lot of fun stuff and he introduced the stacking salad which was all the rage when i was just coming into the food world and um yeah that was pretty funny well, i do a lot of stacking salads but all right that's what i got for you interesting question appreciate you all right from katrina uh loving these ma this is amazing well thank you loving the responses thanks so much very helpful i'm an american living in france and just married a beekeeper so we can put some things on our wedding registry there you go how fun good for you what a wonderful new chapter marriage is the very best thing i ever did and ever will do in my life and i i I trust it will be the same for you. So have so much fun with your, with your, oh my gosh, a beekeeper in France. There you go. How romantic. Very cool. All right. From Clifford, Katrina, I appreciate you. All right. From Clifford. Greetings, Jeff. I joined a little late, but I'm wondering if you have a recommendation of a good set of quality kitchen knives that will last. Thank you. Sure. Um, I really like Victorinox knives. Uh, I think that they kind of just fit the bill on, on everything. Um, I have a whole lot of different knives, uh, mostly just because in my positions over the years and for various reasons I was given, I've been given, I've been given so much kitchen stuff in my life and I'm so lucky and fortunate and thankful for that. Um, but I've sort of culled down a lot of things as well, but I really like Victorinox knives. They last, they, 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 they look pretty good. They don't try and get too fancy and you're not spending money on a, on beauty, which you can certainly do. There are Japanese knives that are, I mean, works of art that are also worth a mortgage payment. Um, do you need one of those? No, you know, I, I don't think so. So Victorinox knives, I really like. Um, and then a, a company whose knives I kind of reach for a, a lot are these uh, carbon steel uh, from R. Murphy Knife Company. I really like what they do. Uh, they were a small family owned um, company out of Massachusetts. I believe they got bought by Dexter company a, a while ago, but they just, they're beautiful knives. They patina. Well, yeah, some people would freak out that their knife looks like that. A, I've got two small children. I don't have time to freak out about anything. Um, and I like the patina of these. They hold the carbon steel holds a blade, holds an edge really, really well. Um, they look good. They last forever. But again, uh, earlier I made reference to, to the locks and um, uh, Cook's, Illust Cook's, Cook's Illustrated having a, a nice little sort of rundown of different locks and properties. So Cook's Illustrated recently, I, I think I saw it on Instagram maybe, just recently did a rundown of the best chef's knives and Victorinox and R. Murphy both came out pretty highly, I believe in that. Uh, Victorinox I know did. Um, but that would be another a great resource to check out just because they're going to have a lot of you know, little nuances and some information about each of these also, as well as some price points. And that's what I like about the Victorinox ones is that quality for price, um, you're not really going to get beaten. So, all right. That is the last of the questions from all of you lovely, wonderful humans that chose to spend some time in your day with me. Thank you. That's very kind of you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you. Again, I hope that you take a moment to just sort of reflect on gratitude, whatever it is in your life that you are grateful for. Reflect on the act of love that is feeding other people. So even if it's a stressful Tuesday night dinner and you just got to get it on the table, bottom line is you're still telling people you love them. So we love having you as part of the Ruby family. Thanks for joining us. Come back and see us again for any of these open office hours events or any of my events. We run about every other week. If you've got any ideas for a themed event that you might like to see, any specific topic that we could dive into, cook up a couple dishes or, you know, do uh, just a deep study of, hey, let us know. Send me an email, barton at ruby.com. Um, yeah, as always, the whole Ruby team is here for you. Appreciate you. Take care. See you now.